Hi, thanks for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel. And what I want to talk about in this video is a set of writings that are credited to somebody who's now called Pseudo Dionysius. So my last video was on Plato's Parmenides on the first hypothesis, the one as completely transcendent of the whole creation, the whole unfolding of reality. Well, I think that Pseudo Dion this is a nice time to introduce Pseudo Dionysius because his, these writings also focus on that, especially one that I'm going to focus on today called Mystical Theology. And we're going to see that these writings take the language of Christianity but put it in a Platonic framework. And so they are kind of bridging Platonism and Christianity. Before I go into this writing, though, called Mystical Theology, I want to talk a little bit about who is this person that we call Pseudo Dionysius, and why do we call this person Pseudo? Well, there are a series of writings that surfaced in 532, four writings in total, plus a series of letters, some of them quite lengthy, and though some of the writings quite lengthy, the one I'm going to look at today not so lengthy. I do have this collection of um, the complete works. You can see it is a bit thick. Um, it's, um, for those of you who are interested, it's not very expensive, and also a lot of the writings are available online. In fact, the one I'm going to look at today, I will be giving you a PDF up for it. There's one in the description box, but I'll talk about that when I get to it. So these writings surfaced in 532 AD, and they were, were said to be the writings of someone called Dionysius the Areopagite. Now, um, an Areopagite is um, a member of the Athenian High Court, a justice on the High Court. It would be like in the American system, being a justice on the Supreme Court. Um, just as a side note, by the way, I try to be a responsible YouTuber and find the correct pronunciation of this word. And I found that here on YouTube, there were like five or six different videos of how to pronounce this word. Every single one of them was different. So it seems that even some people making videos on how to pronounce this word do not know how to pronounce it. So I don't feel bad, and if you don't know how to pronounce it, please don't feel bad either. Um, I think that probably chances are one of those videos was correct. I just don't know which one it is. But anyway, this person, Dionysius, is mentioned in the Bible in Acts 17.34, and here's a quote from the King James Study Bible. Certain men clave unto Paul and believed, among the which was Dionysius, the justice of the Athenian, on the Athenian Supreme Court, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So there is an actual Dionysius who was a follower and contemporary of Paul, and because of this mention of Dionysius and because these writings were credited to this Dionysius that carried a certain authority and gave these writings a certain authority. Um, they were part of the um, Christian canon for maybe about a thousand years, um, both um, among um, Catholic and among Protestant scholars. They they lost favor, you might say. They fell out of favor um, around the 1500s. But they were found in 532 AD. This is when they first surfaced. And what is special about the year 532? Well, now that we know that the writer did not, was not actually a contemporary of the biblical Paul, now that we know that the writer was probably a Platonist, in fact, later scholars have found that there are like whole sections that seem to be lifted almost verbatim from Proclus very few words changed or just add a few, you know, Christian sounding um, words and you've changed Proclus into Christianity. So it's very similar to Proclus. So very Neoplatonic. And now that we know that, we can see a certain significance to this date because in 529 AD, all of the philosophy schools in the Greek world were closed down. An, a Christian emperor named um, Justinian, sorry, I forgot his name, slipped my mind for a minute there, um, named Justinian, was very much against the pagan religions, against these systems, and so he closed all of the philosophy schools, and all of the teachers were banished, and many of their students went with them. Now, there was a Platonic school 
Um, it's not the same one that Plato opened. There is this romantic story that Plato's academy was open from Plato's day all the way to 529. I heard that story when I first got into Plato and I assumed it to be true. I accepted it as true, but I found that it actually is not. Um, Plato school was open for about 400 years or so. It closed around 80 AD, and it wasn't until the 5th century, early 5th century, maybe around 410, 415, when a revised Platonic Academy opened. And it was that revised academy that gave us uh, philosophers like Syrianus and Proclus. And the final headmaster was named Damasius. Now, Damasius and his followers fl um, fled to Syria in 529 AD. And it was just three years later that suddenly, oh, look, these writings that are so Platonic-like and yet are Christian. So like all the ideas that Damascus was teaching are here. Now, some people have surmised that he is actually the author. He's probably the most famous Platonist of his day and because he was the headmaster, and so maybe that's why they assign it to him. It is a nice story. I like Damascus very much, especially his... Um, problems and solutions concerning first principles. You'll there For those of you who have read it, there are a lot of similarities between the ideas of that writing and the mystical theology we're going to look at today. So the actual writer, whether it was Damascus or one of his students, probably did have those sorts of ideas. If it wasn't Damascus, it was someone who was perhaps one of his students or in some way was influenced by him. Okay, so there are though many, like as I said, it was about a thousand um, years that these writings were accepted into the um, Christian canon, and especially among um, Catholics, I think around the 13th century, you'll find there are a number of uh, very important thinkers who were influenced by these writings, and St. Bonaventure is one of them, who was also influenced by St. Augustus. Also, St. Thomas Aquinas, who is said to have quoted or referenced Dionysius some 1,700 times in his writings. Also, Meister Eckert can be tied um, to, um, to Dionysius. Dionysius was one of his influences as well, especially in the idea of the Godhead being prior to the Trinity. So these writings were, t were um, well revered for a very long time, until 1457, when along came an Italian priest and scholar named Lorenzo Bala, who questioned the authenticity of these writings, pointing out a number of discrepancies and pointing out that this Dionysius of the Bible was a justice, not a philosopher, so it's highly unlikely he would have written anything down, and certainly not this much. And there are also references in his writings, and these writings, two writings that no longer exist, so either they were imaginary or they're lost to us. So he may have written more, and it wasn't very realistic, he said. And then over the years, then other people pointed out things and found like the, the similarities to Proclus, for example. But it still took another hundred years after Lorenzo Bala before it really fell out of fancy with Christians because it was just um, so profound and important, and um, he was an influence to some other very influential um, Catholics and Protestants. And so... It took quite a while for his writings to fall out of fancy. But as Platonists, we certainly don't need to be bothered by the idea that it was a forgery or a fake because it was a Platonist who wrote them. And these ideas we see are quite consistent with our metaphysics, but it's written with the language of Christianity. And so those of you coming from that background may find it very comfortable to see that language that you find very comfortable with the metaphysics of the Platonic tradition. And with that introduction, I'm going to go into the mystical theology. Now, this writing is not very long, only maybe seven or eight pages. I'm going to pull out some of the quotes, but I do encourage you to read it for yourself, to see it in whole. Um, I will, there is a PDF in the description box of this exact translation I'm going to use, and it's the same translation that I have here, actually. I found it in PDF form. So let's um, you know, get into it now. So chapter one. Now the title names were in the book, and I'm not sure if those are the translators' titles or if those were Dionysius's titles, but I give them to you anyway. So chapter one is the longest of the five chapters that we're going to look at here. 
um, what is the divine darkness? So bringing the idea of darkness and lightness, it has a certain Christian feeling, but also it fits into this uh, metaphysics that we're looking at. You're going to see how it's used throughout, and I think it's really quite ingenious the way he wrote this out. So it's written to Timothy, another contemporary of, and follower of Paul. Timothy, my friend, my advice to you as you look for a sight of the mysterious things is to leave behind you everything perceived and understood, everything perceptible and understandable, all that is not and all that is. These are very long sentences, aren't they? And with your understanding laid aside to strive upward as much as you can toward union with him, who is beyond all being and knowledge. And so we see that we're looking at that same transcendent God that we were looking at in the uh, first hypothesis of Plato's Parmenides. Only here we're, we're thinking of him as God rather than as the one. So we're, not, we're no longer using the language of pure metaphysics. Now it is put in the language of Christianity. He goes on to say that since it is the cause of all beings, we should posit and ascribe to it all the affirmations we make in regard to beings, and that's the second hypothesis in Plato's Parmenides, and more appropriately, we should negate all these affirmations since it surpasses all being. And that is the first hypothesis that I did a video on last time. The good cause of all has neither word nor act of understanding, since it is on a plane above all this. And it is made manifest only to those who travel through foul and fair, who pass beyond the summit of every holy ascent, who leave behind them every divine light, every voice, every word from heaven. So notice he's bringing in this Christian imagery and who plunge into the darkness where, as scripture proclaims, there dwells the one who is beyond all things. So here again, notice that how he's using darkness. It's not darkness in the negative sense, but darkness in the highest sense of being beyond the light. And this idea of dwelling with the one, it's giving a personification to the one, it dwells there. Um, this word is going to come up again in a moment. It is not for nothing that the blessed Moses is commanded to submit first to purification and then to depart from those who have not undergone this. When every purification is complete, he hears the many-voiced trumpets. He sees the many lights, pure and with rays streaming abundantly. So what's being described here is what we might call a light experience, an enlightenment experience, an awakening experience, a peak experience, many different names for it. But that's what's being described here. And notice what he's going to do with this. He says, and yet he does not meet God himself, but contemplates not him who is invisible, but rather where he dwells. So there's the idea of dwelling again. Now, this has its parallels in Plato. In Plato's Republic, the height of the allegory of the cave is seeing the sun itself in its own place, where it dwells. But that's not the end of the philosopher's journey, because there's still, at 540a in the Republic, there's a reference to rising to the good, and that would correspond to the idea of meeting God himself in the way it's, it's in, the, in the language of this writing here. So it has its parallel in Platonism as well. But then, so Moses was not complete, was only at stage three of, of the philosopher's journey as I um, outlined it before. I do have a video on that. Um, but he does go on to that stage five, he says, but then Moses breaks free of them away from what sees and is seen and he plunges into the truly mysterious darkness of unknowing. This also parallels the journey in the Republic because the upper world of the allegory of the cave is the realm of knowing. And to go beyond that then, you're going into unknowing, the darkness of unknowing in the highest sense, again, not in the lowest. 
Here, being neither oneself nor someone else, he is supremely united to the completely unknown by an inactivity of all knowledge and knows beyond the mind by knowing nothing. Sounds very much like Plato's Apology where Socrates says that he knows nothing. Okay, now I'm going to go on to chapter two. Chapter one was by far the longest chapter. The rest of them are not very long, but I am giving you quite a few of the passages from these remaining chapters. There are five in total. By the time we get to chapters four and five, I'm giving you them almost entirely because there are just so many parallels to the Parmenides hypothesis one. We'll see as we go on. So chapter two is called how one should be united and attribute praises to the cause of all things, who is beyond all things. We're going to see a great deal of the kind of language that Platonists use here. But now, as we climb from the last things up to the most primary, we deny all things, so that we may unhiddenly know that unknowing, which itself is hidden from all those possessed of knowing, amid all beings, so that we may see above being that darkness which is concealed from all the light among beings. And so here we see that the exercise that we that Plato gave us to do in the Parmenides with his first hypothesis is really the same exercise that this pseudo-Dionysius is telling us that we should do. Now going on to chapter 3. What are the affirmative theologies and what are the negative? And here's where we're really going to see a lot of the language that Platonists use. I have shown the sense in which the divine and good nature is said to be one and then triune. So again, in Platonism, we call the highest sense of God the one or the good. And here you see it as well. And its nature is the intelligible, which we sometimes talk about as one and sometimes as a triad. So we use the word triad instead of triune, but the same idea of one and three is here. And how these core lights of goodness grew from the incorporeal and the indivisible good. And how in the sprouting they have remained inseparable from their co-eternal foundation in it, in themselves and in each other. So there's the highest sense of the forms is that, or the um, absolute realities, things in themselves, is that they transcend those which participate in them. But there's also a sense in which they are imminent, and it is all inseparable, and each is in each. In the Divine Names, which is another one of his writings, you can find it in his complete works, and perhaps online, I haven't looked for it. But in the divine names, I have shown the sense in which God is described as good, as existence, as life, as wisdom, as power, and whatever other things pertain to the conceptual names for God. These, again, correspond perfectly to um, to Platonism. So the idea of the one or the good, um, often talked about um, like in the dialogue Philebus, um, there he uses the idea of one, and He says that the one creates through bound and infinity. And bound, Proclus tells us, is the truly one. It's that which truly binds things into one. What we call one is greater than one, as we saw in the first hypothesis. So bound is the truly one, and infinity is its infinite power. And one and good are two names for one another. So in Christianity, they prefer good to one, so they call it good and power. It would, would correspond to bounded infinity. And then the mixed is the intelligible, which is being life and intellect, and here called existent life and wisdom. Um, the fact is that the more we take flight upward, the more our words are confined to the ideas we are capable of forming. So we find greater and greater limitation. That's why we must purify, purify ourselves of all of our assumptions, all of our images, because words, while they're um, quite um, freeing of our soul early on in our practice, there's a point where they become confining. And he says, so that now as we plunge into that darkness, which is beyond intellect, we shall find ourselves not simply running short of words, but actually speechless and unknowing. 
So there again, the idea of darkness and the idea of going beyond knowledge to the unknowing in that higher sense. And now chapter four, that the supreme cause of every perceptible thing is not itself perceptible. So first we're going to um, rid ourselves or deny of this supreme cause anything in time and space. The cause of all is above all and is not inexistent, lifeless, speechless, or mindless. So when we say that this cause, this transcendent one, as we call it in the um, in the first hypothesis, when we say that it is not speech, we don't mean that it's less than speech. When we say it does not exist, we don't mean it in the lower sense, but in the higher sense of being above existence, beyond it, and same with all these terms. It is not a material body, and hence it has neither shape nor form, quality, quantity, or weight. So those of you who are familiar with the first hypothesis in Plato's Parmenides will see a lot of parallels here. It is not in any place and can neither be seen nor be touched. It is neither perceived nor is it perceptible. The idea of touch, by the way, does come up in the second hypothesis, not in the first. It suffers neither disorder nor disturbance and is overwhelmed by no earthly passion. It is not powerless and subject to the disturbances caused by sense perception. It endures no deprivation of light. It passes through no change, decay, division, loss, no ebb and flow, nothing of which the senses may be aware. So this was in the idea uh, in the um, first hypothesis, this was expressed by the idea that it cannot be altered, that it cannot change decay and so on, and also doesn't move in any way. And again, the idea of light is brought in here also. It's not a deprivation of light. None of all this can either be identified with it nor attributed to it. So tying it all together. So that's the end of chapter four. And now we end with chapter five. And now he goes beyond the perceptible to the conceptual. That the supreme cause of every conceptual thing is not itself conceptual. It is not soul or mind, nor does it possess imagination, conviction, speech, or understanding. Nor is it speech per se, or understanding per se. It cannot be spoken of, and it cannot be grasped by understanding. The same conclusion that Parmenides came up with. It is not number or order, greatness or smallness, equality or inequality, similarity or dissimilarity. It is not immovable, moving or at rest. Again, it could have been ripped straight from Plato's Parmenides. That dialogue was very likely a big influence on whoever wrote this. It has no power. It is not power, nor is it light. It does not live, nor is it life. It is not a substance, nor is it eternity or time. It cannot be grasped by the understanding, since it is neither knowledge nor truth. It is not kingship. It is not wisdom. It is neither one nor oneness divinity nor goodness. Again, equating the one and the good, just as Platonists do. It falls neither within the predicate of non-being nor of being. So again, any dichotomy you can think of, it's not one or the other, it's neither. There is no speaking of it, nor name, nor knowledge of it. Darkness and light, error and truth, it is none of these. It is beyond assertion and denial. So again, the same exercise that Plato gave us. We make assertions and denials of what is next to it, but never of it. This is important to understand in terms of the Parmenides as well, because again, the reason for the first hypothesis for us as students is not just to read it in a discursive way, but to actually go through the exercise of cleansing ourselves, to rid ourselves of even what is, we would say is next to it, what beliefs we have about the idea of a first principle, 
that is beyond knowledge. Whatever you think you know, whatever you're holding right now, that is only next to what the first hypothesis is actually pointing to. It is both beyond every assertion, beyond being the perfect and unique cause of all things, and by virtue of its preeminently simple and absolute nature, it is free of every limitation, beyond every limitation. It is also beyond every denial. And so he is leaving us with that very same exercise that Plato gave us. And this is also very consistent with Damascus and the way he would challenge his students to go beyond all the various books that they had by that time because he was the last of the headmasters there. So they had Plato, they had Plotinus, they had Proclus, they had everyone in between. And so there are probably many students at the academy who were quite cocky, who thought that because they'd read all this stuff, that they were wise, and he was challenging them in his um, problems and solutions concerning first principles. This is Damascus. He was challenging them to go beyond any, any thoughts that they had about what reality is and what are the causes of reality. So he's challenging them there, and that is the very challenge here, to go beyond what you think you know of this first principle, because what um, Parmenides called the first hypothesis goes beyond that, beyond even every denial. So I hope you found that interesting. Again, there is a PDF of the full text in the description box for those of you interested in reading it. And if you have any questions or comments, you can drop me an email or leave a comment below. I always love to see your comments and I'm sure other viewers like to see them as well. If you like this video, please give it a like and think about subscribing. And my next video then will be on the second hypothesis of Plato's Parmenides. Thank you very much.